Good morning. Merry Christmas. So you can't just save that for Christmas. We've got to work on that all month long. So uh, welcome those watching the live stream. Merry Christmas to you as well. Thank you for tuning in and joining us. Now, before I jump into today's message, I want to highlight an announcement. Um, I know they've already talked about Joyful Noise tonight. Hope you come back for uh, that, that performance. We're going to have a great time this evening. But this, so you have this. I think we have this. Can you go just, just grab this? Because I'm not going to go through it word for word. But uh, there's lots of information on here. It says Joyful Noise Christmas Program. And it says Around the Table Fundraiser. All right. What's this about? We're raising money for Guatemala. Because uh, we've been going there for 15 years. We have been, we start, helped start a school down there and a church down there. There's 170 kids in what's called Light of the World a School. And Guatemala is the worst place for childhood malnutrition in the Western Hemisphere. And so since we're involved down there, we, you know, the Lord has us making a difference in their lives. School, education, come and know Jesus, and we are helping them with nutrition. So we're raising money because years ago we raised money for a nutrition program. The money's running out. And so $25,000 will do two things. It will buy some picnic tables and some umbrellas so they have a place to eat their food. All right? Right now they sit on the ground. So we can do better. But the main thing is that we're going to raise enough money. $25,000 will feed the entire school 170 kids for two years. Two years. All right? So we solve this problem. We are going to do this. And so some of you, I know, some of you are newer to Foothills and you're like, oh my gosh, $25,000. You're talking to a guy who's raised millions of dollars for Foothills, okay? And I'm like, $25,000? No big deal. We got this. Just to let you know, if we all jump in and get involved, 1,000 people, 25 bucks a piece, done, all right? Every Sunday morning when we're here, we're engaging sometimes 1,200 or more people at the same time, in services, live stream, okay? Easy goal to reach. My guess is we'll kill it and even do more. So let's feed hungry kids. That's what that's about. The QR code is there. You do the little QR code thing, and it takes you right to the giving page. It walks you through, and I think it actually says around the table. Right? So if you see that, that's the Guatemala fundraiser. There you go. And I'll talk more about it every week until the end of December, all right? And we will celebrate what God does. Because uh, th- you know what? God has the resources, so it'll be exciting to see what he does. Now, today, here at Foothills, we uh, talk a lot about following Jesus. Well, I just did, you know, even to Guatemala. We're not a religious place, so if you were looking for a religious church, so, <laughs> sorry, no, that's not us. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right. We are a following Jesus kind of place. As a, yeah, that's amazing. Oh, you guys are already into this today. This is going to be fun, okay? So, <laughs> as amazing as following Jesus is in this life, it's not always easy. It, it's just not. Following requires faith. It requires trust. It means others won't always understand your behavior or what you do. It may even impact your reputation. It might even cost you friends. So, this has certainly been my journey, following Jesus. So over 25 years ago, uh, God called uh, Lisa and I to start Foothills in our hometown. See, that's not something that's very common. And at the time, I was told it couldn't be done. I was told it shouldn't be done. I was told God would never bless it. Anyway, I lost friends over starting this church. My reputation was damaged starting this church. Even after all these years, 25 plus years, there are still people angry at me in this community. How do you know that? Hey, listen, I do a lot of funerals. And funerals, like, you're in a community this long, they're like a family reunion. (laughs) They just are. And so you see people, and you try to go up and talk to them, and you find out really fast which ones are still hanging on to their stuff. Just saying. All right. Despite all this, we were convinced God wanted to do something. And he asked us to follow My experience here at Foothills over the past 25 years has taught me a lot about what following Jesus looks like. It's messy. It often does not line up with conventional wisdom. And believe me, people will not always understand. Yet following requires you to listen to the right voice in order to see God do great things. 2,000 years ago, God was going to teach a young couple named Mary and Joseph. 
some similar lessons about following and what faith looks like. Their mission was a little bigger than starting a church. I mean, they were going to be the parents of the Messiah, all right? As we know him as Jesus. To get them on board with the plan, an angel had to do a little bit of convincing. And so often what I do about when stories in the Old Testament or the New Testament, I love to tell stories, and some of you know that. Um, and sometimes I summarize the stories. I'm not doing that today. I'm going to actually just read this encounter with the angel and Mary and the angel and Joseph. And, then, and I just want you to listen. We're not even going to put it on the screen. I just want you to listen as I read God's word, as it describes their faith. And then we're going to pull some principles out of what we learned from how they followed is how we're still called to follow as well. Luke 1, 26 through 38 is the Mary's conversation with an angel. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, remember Gabriel from last week, if you were here, same angel. Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary. Once again, they always say that, all right? The angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. You will name him Jesus. He will be very great. He will be called the son of the most high. The Lord will give him his throne of his ancestor, David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. I mean, what an announcement. Mary asked the angel, excuse me, how, do I, how, how can this happen? I'm a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. The baby will be born, will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. What is more, your relative Elizabeth, remember last week, has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month, for the word of God will never fail. Mary responds, I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And the angel left. Okay. Now she's on board. Now the person she's engaged to, Joseph, needs some convincing too, all right? Because he's not on board yet. So Matthew 1, 18 through 24, is that story. Now let's read this. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement off quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will have a son, and you're to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. All this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message to the prophet that said, look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. Okay. What can we learn about their faith? What can we learn about what following looks like. And I'm going to give you just four essentials today of what that looks like that we learned from this story. Number one is this. Mary and Joseph followed not understanding fully. They didn't understand, in fact, a lot. So let's go back to the story. Luke 1, after the angel shows up, Gabriel gives this grand announcement. Guess what? You're going to be basically the mother of the Messiah. Mary asks the angel, how can this happen? We have a slight problem. Not married yet. I'm a virgin. I mean, it seems like a very fair question. That's a fair question. I mean, she is not, she, she's not rebuked for that question. That's a fair question. And I'm sure the angel's response didn't answer all of her questions either. Oh, let me answer that. Mary, you're, you're going to be with child for, of the Holy Spirit. Right. Okay. Like that's ever happened before. All right. It was a far cry from answering all of her questions. Now the angel moves on to Joseph. Can you imagine all the things going through his mind? I mean, before the angel showed up, he was going to break off the engagement. He's going to break it off. Why was he going to break it off? Be because he's not buying this Holy Spirit thing. 
Hey, Joseph, guess what? I got some bad news. I'm pregnant. What? Who's the guy? No, no, there's no other guy, okay? It's, it's the Holy Spirit. I mean, I had an angel talk to me, and the angel said, it's like, seriously, we're done. All right? Well, he's going to break it off, so he's not on board. I sometimes I try to imagine that conversation, how that took place. No, there's nobody else. There has to be somebody else. There's nobody else. Well, there is, but it's God. I mean, how do you explain this? All right. Therefore, the angel confirms that story to Joseph in a dream, gets him on board. But their responses, despite all the questions they must have had, is remarkable. Mary responds and says, I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you say happen. May everything you say come true. Whew. And then Joseph, Matthew 1, 24, he woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and took Mary as his wife. Now, I just, I'll just stop and think about this. Let's not romanticize this. I'm not here to ruin your Christmas stories. Really, I'm not. But, but they were not given a plan. They were not given a blueprint. They were not given a detailed manual on how to raise the Messiah, the Savior of the world. They were not told how to convince their relatives or their friends Huh, or even each other. An angel had to do that. They were commanded to follow. So let me ask you some questions. How often does our understanding get in the way of following Jesus in this life? I am not saying following Jesus is anti-intellectual. God gave us minds. He wants us to use them. I'm saying that following Jesus transcends our intellect. Which means we do not have the right to hold God hostage until he explains all the details of his plan to us before we decide to follow. Because I see this a lot. There's just too many Christians who, they read God's word and, and, and they say, well, you know what, that doesn't really make sense, Pastor Dale. How can that be? I don't get it. I don't understand. I, 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 I'm not going to do that until I understand it. Some of you are like, okay, what, what do you mean? Well, I mean, let me just use a couple of examples from Scripture because, you know, the Bible does say some, the Bible says some stuff that's hard to understand when you first read it, right? Jesus says something like this. He says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. If you save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll save it. What? Wait a minute, Jesus. Time out. I don't understand that because that makes no sense. Come on. I mean, come on. First of all, how do, I how do I save my life if I lose it? You want me to give up my life for you? You want me to, wait, deny myself? Don't you, don't you care about my feelings, God? Hmm? Deny myself? How can I be satisfied if I deny myself? That doesn't make any sense. D deny my, tell my desires no? Doesn't God want me happy? So we kind of just stay put and don't even try to follow. I mean, Jesus says some other radical stuff. Well, like what? Matthew 6, 33, he says, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. What are all these things? He always talked about these material things that we worry about, food and clothing and this and that, all right? And so we read a verse like that and we go, come on, how can that be? So, so what? So what? I mean, I'm not supposed, supposed to provide for myself? Make God a priority in my life? Make his righteousness, his truth, his values, his kingdom a priority? I mean, come on, that's not even rational. I don't get it. I don't understand. I tell you what, God, I'll make you a piece of my busy life, okay? Because I'm, I'm seeking your kingdom. I'll make you a piece of all the things I have to do every day and every, right? There's even part of it. Seek first. Doesn't make any sense. How much is your following impacted by your understanding? That's, that's, that's just a question I want you to think about. Is it possible, this is what Jesus meant when he said, you need to have faith of a child. He didn't say be childish, okay? It's the faith of a child. It'd be like, you know, me trying to explain the complexities of my life to a two-year-old. They just can't understand it. But I need them to do things. Not to insult your intelligence, but, you know, he's God. We're not. The distance between us is infinite. His ways are higher than our ways, the Bible says. He doesn't owe us any explanation whatsoever. In fact, what I have discovered is that information is always on a need-to-know basis only. And if you don't need to know, he doesn't tell you, okay? He just wants you to follow. 
Sometimes when we demand understanding, we want God to remove the element of faith for us. I won't, I won't do this until you explain it to me. And he says, you live by faith. Amen. I know better than you. So follow me. How much of your following is impacted by understanding? Are there some areas of obedience? Maybe you've been telling God no because it doesn't make sense to you. Following God does not require full understanding. Mary and Joseph lived that. All right, number two. Mary and Joseph followed despite the opinions of others. So we don't see any opinions in the story. It's not recorded, but we know enough about the historical context to know that there, it would be a complete surprise, uh, again, from, from family and friends, over Joseph still marrying a pregnant woman with a baby that wasn't his. Or was it? See? Or was it? From the family and friends perspective. Once again, can you imagine the conversations that he must have had with his family and with his friends? How many people told him he's making a terrible mistake? Joseph, don't marry that girl. Come on. How can you ever trust her again? She's pregnant for crying out loud. Yeah, I know, but it's just God wants me to. Give me a break. Listen, she cheated on you. You'll never be able to trust her for the rest of your life. On Right? I mean, he was going to break off the engagement. Even after they were both on the same page, boy, I'm sure there were other opinions that were swirling around them. How many people tried to talk Joseph out of it? Don't do it, buddy. Don't do it. Mary and Joseph followed despite the opinions of others. Despite. Jesus later condemned the religious leaders when he was growing up in his ministry. He condemned the, the religious leaders for being more committed to the opinions of God, chasing, I mean, chasing the opinions of people rather than the opinion of God. He says this in John 12, for they, the religious leaders, love the approval, the opinions of people rather than the approval of God. Mary and Joseph were more motivated by God's approval rather than the approval of their family, the approval of their friends, the approval of society. What about us? See, we live in an age where we are just you know, trained to desire the approval of people. I mean, come on, social media, it just does that, right? I mean, it, it has just groomed us in that. You post something on social media. There's nothing, we use social media, so I'm not picking on social media. I'm just picking on what it's done to us. They post something up there, you know. How many people saw it? How many, how many likes did you get? How many comments did you get? All right? How many followers do you have? Okay? Did you get a five-star rating on your podcast? By the way, I need a five-star rating on our podcast that we do. That's what I'm saying. Okay? If you haven't watched the podcast or listened to it, you should. It's really fun, okay? And the five-star rating helps us drive it forward. But anyway, beside that, all right? See? You really should give us a five-star. Anyway, none of this is evil in and of itself, but it can cause us to chase the wrong things instead of God's approval. Proverbs 29, 25 says, fearing people is a dangerous trap. It is. Trusting the Lord means safety. Chasing after his approval. That's where we find safety. How much of our obedience is connected to the fear of losing approval from people? I just want you to think about that today. I mean, what if people knew that you were a sold out follower of Jesus? What will they think of me if I share my faith? What will they think of me if, if they find out that man, I go to church a lot? I'm, I'm going on a mission trip to Guatemala. You know, I serve in a ministry. You know, I embrace biblical values in a world that tells us all kinds of things that, oh, you must believe in hate speech or you must believe in, really? Oh, I'm just going to be quiet or I'm not going to say anything. What do they think of me? Oh, no, I can go. Following Jesus despite the opinions of others. It doesn't mean we're rude. It doesn't mean we're judgmental. It doesn't mean we're critical. It simply means that our loyalties have been decided. Our loyalties have been decided. I am more loyal to Jesus than you. I love you guys. Okay? I do. But if you ever put me in a position to choose loyalty to Jesus or to you, I'll choose Jesus. Well, that'll never happen. Happens all the time. All the time. 
You see, I make decisions as a follower of Jesus based on values, biblical values, which means I will choose those values over your feelings, over your emotions, over your opinions. If you put me in a place as a leader of this church to choose what following Jesus looks like or making you happy. Do you know why I've lost friends, people, family members? It's for that issue right there. So if that ever happens, uh, I, I don't want you to hear me. I'm not being unloving, but you're putting me in a place to choose loyalty, and I've already decided what my loyalties are. You should too. You should too, okay? Yeah. So, so I hope you clap when we have that conversation, okay? <sighs> But please understand my heart, because that's the heart of a follower of Jesus. I'm choosing to follow him. Well, I disagree with that decision. Okay, okay, but please understand it's based on a value, not on all of this emotion, okay? Mary and Joseph followed despite the opinions of others. How about you? Will you? Okay, number three. Number three. Mary and Joseph followed despite fear of their reputations. Now, go back to the story. And we look at Joseph here in verse 19 of Matthew 1. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man, did not want to div- disgrace her publicly. So he found out she was pregnant, however that was. She ran to him immediately, or he, he, he found out because she was showing. We don't know how it all happened. But when he found out, he decided to break the engagement quietly. He's, he's worried about her reputation, his reputation. He's worried about that. He wanted to protect her, maybe even himself. Of course, we know that later the angel changed his mind and they got married anyway. But here's what I want you to understand. Even though, okay, it all worked out, Pastor Dale. They got on the same page. Well, you need to understand. It cost them. To follow would cost them their reputation for the rest of their lives. They would live with a social stigma forever. Most people were going to forever look at Mary as the girl from Nazareth who got pregnant before she was married. The stigma did not only follow them, but it followed Jesus into his adult life. It was still well known, even as Jesus began his public ministry. This was actually now part of Jesus' reputation. Can you imagine? It was part of Jesus' reputation. How do I know that? Because Jesus, in John 8, is in an interchange with the religious leaders, and they're going back and forth, and Jesus is talking about their behavior, and he says, you guys just do what your, 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 your fathers did. You're doing exactly what your earthly fathers did. Look, John 8, 41. He says, you're doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, we were not born as a result of sexual immorality. They knew. Isn't that something? That you guys... That might be brand new information for some of you. Followed them their whole life. Even Jesus. So can you imagine Mary and Joseph knowing full well their reputations would be forever changed and yet they followed anyway? Knowing that they'd never be looked at the same. Now, let me ask you that question. Would you do that? Would we do this? Would we follow knowing that our reputations would take a hit? Knowing that we would never be able to convince some people that we're following Jesus. No, we're following Jesus. No, you're not. And that may never change for the rest of your life. Would you still follow? In this day and age, it seems people love damaging each other's reputations. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a hobby out there in the world, right? Technology today has created more ways to hurt and wound and discredit people that we disagree with and any other time in modern history, world history, good grief. All people have to do is send out that mean spirit of social media post, fill in a few blanks, sit back and watch the fun and how people jump in. People love to create false narratives, not having all the information. They fill in gaps of their understanding with their flesh. Oh, this must be the way it is. This must have happened for all the world to see. Same thing happened to Mary and Joseph. Didn't need social media, all right? Same thing happened. I bet, after, I bet after a while they didn't even try to explain to people anymore. I'm at the front end. Oh, an angel, Holy Spirit. But see, no one's buying the narrative. So after a while, you don't even, you don't even say it anymore. Who's going to believe the angel story? It's much more tantalizing to believe the worst in people and spread that narrative 
And when I read that, and when I know that the, the religious leaders threw it back into Jesus' face, okay, 30 years later, people have not changed in 2,000 years, folks, have they? Still the same. Still the same. When it comes to our reputations, men and women, it's better to go quiet. Trust your reputation to God. Our focus is on following, not on defending your reputation. Let your life speak for itself. Let God defend you. Some of you may be trying to outlive some reputation from your past. Maybe it was earned. We've all earned, earned some of our reputation, right? Maybe it wasn't earned. Either way, your focus needs to be on following, not on trying to defend or correct or rebut some reputation that somebody has of you. You'll never be able to control what people think of you, but you can control how you follow Jesus. Your reputation with God is far more important than what others think about you. Don't let your past, your reputation, what others think of you, hinder you from following and being all that God has called you to be. People changing their minds about you is not a prerequisite for following. You just follow. And you trust your reputation to Jesus. Now, that's what Mary and Joseph did. Last one. Mary and Joseph followed, believing in God's purpose. They believed in God's purpose. Notice how the angel gives them the assurance of the purposes of God. Listen, in Luke 1, again, he tells Mary, for the word of God will never fail. It will never fail. God's purposes cannot fail. What I'm telling you is true. This is going to happen. Mary responds, I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left. So Mary believed in the purposes of God, gave herself to the purposes of God. Now unto Joseph, when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel commanded, took Mary as his wife. Despite everything, he believed and he followed he believed the purposes of God. How could they have endured all they had to go through without believing they were part of a bigger narrative? They were part of a bigger agenda than merely their own lives. They were part of God-fulfilling prophecies that every Jew was anticipating. Every Jew was looking forward to anticipating the coming of the Messiah. We're part of that narrative. Oh, my gosh. So it didn't matter if they didn't fully understand. It didn't matter. It didn't matter if people's opinions were different than theirs. It didn't even matter if their reputations were destroyed. It didn't matter. The purpose was bigger than all of this. Following was all that mattered. The power in believing God altered their life and gave them endurance for the journey. Belief does the same for us. Are we not called to have the exact same mindset? Are we not called into a greater purpose as well as followers of Jesus? Are we not partners with Jesus in a kingdom narrative on planet earth? Don't we have a calling on our life as well? And so that might be new to some of you, but look, Ephesians 4.1, therefore I, the prisoner for serving the Lord, I beg you, I beg you, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling because you have been called by God. Every one of you has been called by God. It is our belief in the calling that gives us the motivation to walk in the manner worthy because it is not easy. You lose sight of the call, you lose sight of purpose, and we can lose sight of the motivation it takes to follow Jesus in this broken world. Yes, Jesus came to save us. He came to forgive us. He came to give us eternal life. For God so loved the world, he sent his son. And if we believe we have eternal life, but it's not just that, folks. This is the great error of the church okay we just believe and it's all about me and it's all about eternity and it's all about what I get out of it and we do get out of it but we have been called into a lifestyle to follow and we've been called to partner with him with a larger narrative than just my life the self-centeredness of modern Christianity drives me crazy can I just say it drives me crazy it's not all about you. There are people dying without Jesus, and he called us into that, that mission. Look what it says. Come on, Ephesians 2.10. For you are God's masterpiece. By the way, that's who you are. No matter how messy you are today, you're his masterpiece. You're his prized possession. He came after you, okay? 
He's created us anew in Christ Jesus. When we gave our life to him, all things became new so that we could do whatever we want with our life. So what it says. So that we can do the good things that he planned for you and me from eternity past long ago. Purpose. Purpose. Believe in a higher purpose that comes from God that is beyond ourselves and what gives us strength and courage for this journey called life. We're part of a bigger narrative. It's not about just surviving, hanging on until I go to heaven or hanging on until Jesus comes back. That's wrong. That's biblically wrong. You and I are part of God and what he's doing on planet earth. What has kept me in the game as a pastor for now almost 40 years 40 years is this belief right here. The purpose that God has put on my life and the purpose that God has put on this church. The journey is not easy. It is so worth it. You can see our purpose is up on the wall in that living room. Why do we put it there? Because I want you focused on that. Because you're part of that. You come to Foothills, that's part of your purpose too. We're here to reach unchurched people. That's your calling. Part of that is your calling as a child of God, regardless of what church you go to. We are here to reach the unchurched. People who don't know Jesus. We're here to reach. We're here to equip. That's what I'm trying to do right now. Oh, pleading with you. Okay? I'm here to equip you. I'm here to get you ready to learn how to follow Jesus. Let's do this thing. Reach, equip, and then we transform. See, Christians are transformers. We transform what, what we're around. We transform what we touch because, see, Jesus is in us. And so we're here to transform our community. We're here to transform our city. We're not here to leave it the same. Why do you think we're doing boxes? Why do you think we have Christmas projects? Why do you think we go to the, to the Pheasant Point and we do stockings? Why are we going to Guatemala? You say, well, I don't care about that. But you should. You should. Because we are here to make a difference. And that's going to keep you in the game. Not a self-centered approach to Christianity, but what you can get out of it. Because that's why Jesus said, if you want to live, you got to learn to die. You want that to make sense? Live this way. That's why we're going to raise $25,000 to, to send to Guatemala. Don't you dare tell me we can't do this. All right? We are to be, listen, I do not want Foothills to be this normal, average church. God never called us to be normal or average. He called us to be a supernatural force. But that only happens if we follow. That only happens if we start believing what he says. Even if we don't, we don't get it, we don't understand, people think we're crazy. I, I, I want the community to look at us and say, you guys are nuts, okay? That should be our testimony. We're so different than them. We do different things. We give away so much stuff. That's what we do. Okay. This is what keeps me in the game, you guys. I believe this with all my heart and soul. I want you to taste it. I want you to live it. Okay. We wrap this up. How is Jesus asking you to follow? Because it comes down to this. Now you, it's you. How is he asking you to follow him? What's keeping you from following him? Come on, what's keeping you from just going full on? Come on, yeah, Jesus, all the way. I'm all in. I'm not gonna just stick my toe in the water. What, what's keeping you? Is it your understanding? Yeah, Pastor Dale, listen, I just don't understand. I don't care. Neither does Jesus. He's asking you to follow. Come on. Yeah, yeah, but what's your butt? That was weird. Anyway, so, okay, what? <laughs> You know what I meant. <laughs> What's your yeah but? Okay, that's what I meant to say. <laughs> I'm just glad you guys love me, okay? You hear my heart. So is, so is it your understanding that's in the way? Is it, is it your opinions of others? I'm afraid what people are going to think of me. Are you worried about your reputation down the road? Your family, friends? I mean, I don't know. Maybe the thing that's keeping you from following is that you lack purpose. And, and to be honest with you, your version of Christianity is a very self-oriented one. That's why it doesn't work. That's why it's unfulfilling. That's why you don't see any power. That's why, that's why you don't experience Jesus. I, I mean, you guys, I, you know my job is? My job is to try to explain to you how it works. 
I feel like I'm constantly trying to get people, Christians, out of operating in this kingdom and getting them to understand how God's kingdom works. And this is what Jesus tried to do. This, this is, the kingdoms are different. And the invitation is always, follow me to this, this new kingdom, because it really is amazing, but you got to think differently, and sometimes it doesn't make sense. What's stopping you from following? And can you just respond today like Mary did? Hmm? I'm the Lord's servant. Whew. May everything that you said come true. We start responding to Jesus like that and responding to the word of God like that, we will start seeing stuff happen in our life and in this world around us. So let's bow our heads, let's pray. And maybe whatever that issue is that is keeping you from following Jesus, maybe right now you can give that up. Maybe right now in this moment you can just say, Lord, I, I am your servant. May everything that you say today in your word, I want it true in my life. Whatever excuse you've been using, maybe you just said, Lord, I'm getting rid of this excuse. I'm dumping this excuse. I'm laying this excuse before your throne. Lord, here it is. Give it to you. I want to follow. I want to, I want to follow like Mary and, and Joseph did. Lord Jesus, you know sometimes it's hard for us to follow. Sometimes we live with so much fear, fear about what if? What about somebody else? Lord Jesus, I pray that you would give us the faith just to say yes. Lord, I'm your servant. May everything that you say in your word, may it be true in my life. I'll follow you. God, would you take this church and would you breathe life into us? Would you awaken us to your kingdom, your priority, your purpose? You came after us at Christmas, the greatest search and rescue mission the universe has ever seen. That same mission has been handed off to your people. How can we simply grab our piece of it and not share with others? So Lord, may we be a church, dare I say, that will recklessly follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we're going to sing one last song, and it's an upbeat song, and it's a fun song, and it's a moving song. And so if God wires you to move, I expect you to move, okay? okay? Have fun. It is a great Christmas song, one of our favorite Christmas songs here at Foothills. But while some people are celebrating, totally appropriate, some of you are hurting. And so during this last song, even though we are celebrating, we have people here off to my left and in the back corner always ready to pray for you. And if that's what you need, you know what? Take advantage of people here who will love you just as you are. So now, let's stand, let's celebrate, because Jesus came for us. Amen? Amen. Amen.